Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and today's the day I'm going to finish my series on the old garden roses and I saved one of the most interesting classes for last, at least in my opinion. It's the Portland Roses and it all starts with a story about this humble but mysterious rose, the Duchess of Portland which it's winter now, so it doesn't look so impressive, but it is December and it has buds and blooms on it both. So you know it's a reblooming rose, but it's an old European rose. So there's a genetic mystery going on here that I wanna to talk to you about. It's a bit windy outside here, so I'm, I suspect that's gonna get in the way of the sound. Let's move inside so I can put some pictures to this and tell you the story. Some of the most interesting things that happened to roses in rose history happened around the year 1800, give or take a couple of decades. And it's really interesting how many of my other videos on the old garden roses seem to converge around this point. The Chinas and Bourbons would have been arriving from the east, and by a slightly different route, although still from China ancestry, the Noisette roses would have been arriving from the Americas. At this, around the same time, Josephine, Empress Josephine, was making her great collection at Melmaison, and this signaled the height of the era of French breeding of the Gallica roses. So with all of these things happening, with all these extraordinary rose events, there is a mystery around this one rose, this rose, this Duchess of Portland, uh, seems to have been collected by either the second or third Duchess of Portland, thus its name, uh, back to England from places unknown. The first story said Italy, but we really don't know the genesis of this rose. The rose itself is very simple and unassuming. Very wide open flowers, hot pink color, what they would have called red at the time or close to it, and that's about it. But the one thing it did have is it was a rebloomer at a time when the public was very, very thirsty for that reblooming characteristic. The China roses were just arriving and that idea that you could have a rose that bloomed all the way through the year was just an amazing feature compared to the once bloomers in the spring. The thing though is that the Portland rose, the Duchess of Portland, didn't look like the China roses at all. Kind of looked like a Gallica or a Damask rose. And all the rumors about where it came from, you know, as I say, they said it came from Italy and that it was bred from Slater's Crimson China, but that doesn't turn out to be the truth at all. Lots of people who knew the rose as well, including the English rosarian Peter Beals, looked at it and said the character of this is just wrong. He, this was obviously much later. And his suspicions were confirmed when they did genetic testing on this rose. It appears that this is just a straight up cross between the Autumn Damask and the Gallica Rose, which is a bit of a genetic mystery here, if you know what I mean. So I'm gonna go in and explain this here, is that the reblooming characteristic of roses is thought to be a recessive characteristic. And certainly when you saw other crosses happening, and here I'm gonna talk about uh, Cardinal Richelieu as a, as a Gallica cross of a China, or Madame Plantier, which is, a, which is an Alba cross with a China, or a Noisette. And even though one of the parents was reblooming and the other one was non-reblooming, the resulting cross was non-reblooming. So here, if you had a cross between the Autumn Damask, which is a sparse rebloomer in the fall, and a Gallica rose, how could that, which is once blooming, how could that result in a strong rebloomer like the Duchess of Portland? Now, we may never solve the genetic mystery around how that whole thing happened, but what makes it even more confounding is that when the French breeders brought them back and began crossing the Duchess of Portland with their once blooming Gallicas, what resulted was a class of re-blooming roses. Now, I'm not gonna say that these are perpetually blooming roses, but they are the kinds of roses that bloomed in flushes throughout the season. And in terms of their characteristics, they kind of matched a very good intermediate between the Damasks and the Gallicas. That strong Damask scent, the one that you would characterize as the rose perfume scent, mixed with the longer lasting fragrance of the Gallicas, but softer, to me is the finest of all of the scents in roses. And when I smell Rose de Rest, that's what I get, is to my nose, the nicest of all of the scents. And it's that mixture of the Gallica and the Damask. No China involved, as it turns out. The resulting crosses of the French breeders built a class of many hundreds of roses that were all the rage in Europe. And uh, you'll recognize this story that the moss roses came to popularity and then came out of fashion. This happened to the Portlands too, but not before they had a big impact on what it looked like to have a beautiful garden rose. First of all, they weren't 
super tall and lanky like the Elbas and the Damasks, they were shorter and more compact like the Gallicas. They had that nice scent, which I love, and they have that old garden rose uh, look to the flowers, very full petals, uh, nothing of the high centered reflexed petals of the tea roses that were coming in at the time. So in that way, they looked rather old fashioned to the European buyers at the time. They came in those color ranges between white, like Blanc de Weber, or all the way to the deepest red that was available at the time, like Rose de uh, Now, where did they go? Basically, they all disappeared when they went out of fashion. There's only something like in the range of 12 or 15 commercially available uh, Portland roses that you'll find on the market, at least in North America here. There may be some others in collections, but it really has shrunk down. They went out of fashion. What followed after this, and like I say, 1800 and the following years were just like, like an orgy of roses. The hybrid perpetual class came up and that was a mixture of all of those old garden roses, including one of the Portlands as an, as an important parent, Rose de Roy. Now, they mixed in the Bourbons, they mixed in the Gallicas, they mixed in the Portlands, they mixed in everything that was in Europe up to the time and made those hybrid perpetual roses. Now the hybrid perpetuals in their own way, even though they're one of the children of the Portland Rose, they killed the Portland Rose as a class. They had the wider color range of the Chinas, they had some of the new flowering uh, looks to them, the reflex petals, the high centered, the bigger flowers. So in a kind of a way, they kind of wiped the Portlands off the map. What was assumed at the time that the Portland Roses were an offshoot of the China Roses kind of justified them being lumped in with the hybrid perpetuals. But what we know now is that they were a complete genetic abnormality, a, a, a complete diversion in the line of the Gallicas and the Damask Roses, that if they had happened in a slightly different timing, if the China Roses had come a little bit later and they'd had time to establish, I think they would have dominated European Roses for a length of time that would have allowed some interesting hybridization to happen after that time. Of course, we'll never know that, but I do want to go through some pictures of some of the Portland roses that still remain because they are very, very pretty. And in, in my mind, some of the nicest roses that I've grown, although I've only grown a handful here. So of course there is the Duchess of Portland itself, kind of a, um, a lax but low shrub that has simple dark pink flowers and a nice scent and blooms and flushes throughout the season. Two of the most widely grown Portlands now are Comte de Chambord and Rose de Reche. Comte de Chambord in a pleasing light pink and Rose de Reche in it's about as dark as they come, almost red. It's between pink and red, so very beautiful. Uh, I wanna mention Yolanda Aragon because I previously misidentified in that as a Damask Rose in my video on that topic, but it turns out it is a Portland, so it does have some rebloom to it. And I also wanted to mention uh, Blanc de Weber. I mentioned that earlier. It's a white version of the Portland Roses. Last but not least though, what has been widely put out there as one of the best roses of all time is Jacques Cartier. And I can't argue one little bit. I've grown it for the first time in my garden in the last couple of years. And every time I walk by it, it stops me. Beautiful, flat cupped flowers, so many petals, great scent, just a really wonderful and graceful rose and worth having in your garden. And before I finish up here, I just want to throw up a graphic showing where the Portland roses end up on my family tree of roses. And you'll see, of course, uh, up above it, the parents are the Autumn Damask and the Gallica, as I described. And it then goes on a line downwards to show that it's one of the parents of the hybrid perpetuals. All right, thank you so much for watching today and thanks for everybody for their patience of me finishing the series on the old garden roses. I'm gonna link a playlist down below that shows all of my videos on the types of roses, but the whole series is in there. So that's fantastic. And as you may know, it is my tradition on these videos to save one little snippet of information for the very end for those who were patient enough to watch the whole thing. And this has to do with that rose, Rose de Roy, the best known of the uh, Portland Roses and is thought to be the first of the true hybrid perpetuals as well. They kind of give it that special place bridging the two. Uh, it was born as a creation of a French hybridist and I think his name was Lalure. So at first it had that name or Rose de Lalure. Uh, then it followed that it was named 
that the political situation changed in Europe. Uh, Napoleon, as we know, his wife had that big collection of roses at Malmaison. He was defeated and then exiled. And at the time that he was exiled, they reinstalled the King of France, Louis XVIII, I think in this case, and renamed the rose, Rose de Roy, or Rose of the King. Well, a few years later, Napoleon, broke out of uh, exile, came on back, and for some short period of time before he was defeated again, the rose was renamed the Rose of the Emperor rather than the Rose of the King. And then, of course, when he was finally defeated and exiled for the, for the last time, they renamed it back to Rose de Roy. So many roses have interesting stories. I think that one has one of the funner stories of names that I've come across. Thanks so much for watching.